So today's lecture is going to be about stochastic optimization. So this is going to be an offshoot of our uh, discussion of both deterministic optimization and decision analysis. So we've talked about deterministic optimization. Uh, and we uh, talked about that uh, within the context of this specific application of unit commitment problems. And we're going to talk about that some today, um, as well as, you know, leading into our final lecture uh, on uh, generation expansion or capacity planning. Uh, but the key with deterministic optimization is not that uh, things don't change. You can have uh, parameters that are part of the optimization program that are time varying. Uh, but what, what we are implicitly or explicitly assuming um, with deterministic optimization is that those time-varying parameters are certain. In other words, we know how they're going to change. Uh, stochastic, stochastic optimization is an approach or a general approach um, for mathematical optimization that directly incorporates uncertainty. In other words, um, Parameters that are changing through time, uh, but out in the future, we don't know exactly how those parameters are going to change. There's some uncertainty about how that could happen. Um, so, for example, um, you can take the formulation of the unit commitment problem that we looked at for a, this, this is a simplified version of the unit commitment problem for a power system. Uh, the objective function here is to minimize the cost of meeting electricity demand um, over... Uh, a long planning horizon um, of t time periods and so the the objective function is to minimize the start fixed and uh, variable cost associated with electricity production and in this case we've broken out the um, the cost the variable cost functions um, for each power plant into a piecewise linear function which is why we have all these x's here and the main constraint that we're looking at here is that the cumulative amount of electricity that's produced at all our plants has to be greater than or equal to demand minus the availability of wind, solar, and nuclear in every time period that we're considering. So when we talked about deterministic optimization um, and just looking back at that formulation of the unit commitment problem, um, there were a number of parameters that were included there that were time varying. Uh, one would be electricity demand, and we've talked a lot about this semester how electricity demand changes uh, on an hour to hour basis, um, how it changes throughout the week, how it changes on a seasonal basis, and even how it can potentially grow over time um, due to economic activity or changes in population growth. Uh, we've also talked about um, how variable renewable energy can change. Um, you know, solar uh, certainly changes uh, and is dynamic. It's a little more predictable, although there's a significant stochastic element to so solar power production because of cloud dynamics. Um, some of that can be mitigated um, by careful planning um, in terms of how you space different solar projects and the cumulative number of solar projects you you have feeding into the grid. Uh, same thing with wind, uh, and that's what's illustrated in this figure below. Um, this is the difference between a day ahead forecast, so forecasts that are made 24 hours in advance in blue, and actual wind experienced in green. And you can see that, you know, there's overall the, the forecasts do a, <clears throat> do a good job of capturing the low frequency changes, right? So day to day changes that we might uh, attribute to, um, you know, weather or meteorological uh, patterns. Um, but on an hour to hour basis, it's a little tough. There's some error there. Um, and so when we were thinking about the, when we set up the deterministic unit commitment model, when we were incorporating demand and the availability of solar and the availability of wind, uh, out into the future and having that uh, dictate what or help dictate what power plants we're going to turn on and the ones we do turn on how much uh, electricity we're going to produce at each one um, all of those time varying parameters were were known right so we're including the values that we're assuming about those in the future um, 
we're saying that we, we know exactly what those values are going to be, you know, two, three, four days from now. In other words, we're assuming perfect foresight. Um, now, all of those, in fact, are very uncertain. Demand is uncertain. The availability of wind and solar is certain. So what we really have to assume is that um, if we're including information about wind and solar and demand um, regarding the future, those are really forecasts, not um, not necessarily predictions. So if we want to turn our unit commitment model into something that is more akin to stochastic optimization, then what we really want to do is take advantage um, of the fact that there are probability distributions governing uh, the data that we are trying to forecast or that's uncertain. So demand, uh, you know, wind and, and solar availability. Uh, so, for example, uh, we, you know, we spent a lot of time this semester thinking about uh, time series modeling and stochastic modeling, how to represent processes that are a little bit random and are uncertain but have, um, you know, important underlying structures that we need to account for, like uh, the relationship between electricity, demand, and temperature, or um, autocorrelation in daily wind power production um, or noise in solar power production. We have a variety of, of ways to model these processes and ultimately um, there's some underlying element to all of those random processes that is, that is random that we can describe using a probability distribution. So we could say for example, you know, we have this um, constraint on our unit commitment um, problem that ge the cumulative generation at each power plant uh, has to be greater than or equal to demand minus wind minus solar minus nuclear for every hour of the planning horizon. And so we can pull wind out here and say, all right, well, you know, wind is definitely going to be a time varying parameter here. And we may have some forecast about what it's going to be for the next 24 hours. But beyond that, we really don't know. And so we could represent wind beyond the first 24 hours. Uh, using uh, an autoregressive model. Uh, and in, in this case, we have an AR2 model, which means it's looking back two time periods in the past uh, to come up with an estimate about what wind would be in a current time period. And that doesn't, I mean, we could use that to make a prediction about the first 24 hours, but we could also uh, use this stochastic representation of, of, of wind to come up with, you know, a thousand different scenarios for what wind could be in the future, given our forecast of what it's going to be over the next 24 hours. Uh, and in this case, we have a lag two model. So we're saying that wind in, the, in a current time period T is, is simply a product of some, um, you know, potentially mean parameter uh, plus uh, the, the wind uh, one time period ago times a, a B coefficient plus a, B, a second B coefficient times what wind was two time periods ago plus uh, WT. And so WT is this Wiener process or, um, you know, basically just randomly sampling from a Gaussian distribution. So now, if you you know, if we think about having this uh, unit commitment problem set up, and then we have not just for wind, but potentially for solar or or demand as well, um, stochastic representations of these uh, these time varying parameters. In other words, we have built models to represent what demand could be in the future, what wind could be in the future, etc. And what we're really concerned about is modeling or you know scheduling a system of power plants over the next 24 hours um, and so you know from our discussion uh, before thanksgiving we know that when we're running this unit commitment model we have to incorporate some information about what the future is going to look like beyond the first 24 hours uh, because the decisions we make in the first 24 hours may have what we would call path dependency right they may may alter our flexibility in dealing with some sort of unknown circumstance in the future. And so if we have some idea of what that unknown circumstance in the future could be or could look like, we need to incorporate it into our decisions about what we're doing today if the goal is to, to minimize the cost of meeting electricity demand. For example, uh, 
you know, demand renewable energy production could go up or down suddenly in the future. Now, there's some possibility of that happening always, uh, but we may be able to, to sort of predict that um, based on, you know, uh, numerical weather prediction or something else. Um, and if it goes up or down, that may affect what power plants we turn on or off. Or on or off. And remember, there are significant costs associated with starting power plants because you have to expend a lot of fuel to ramp power plants, some power plants, um, up, to, uh, up to the point where they're synchronized with the grid, where they're operating at 60 hertz. Uh, other plants may have minimum up or down constraints. So if you make a decision now to turn on a power plant to meet electricity demand, um, depending on what power plant that is, it may require you to keep that plant on for another 48 or, you know, 72 hours. And if you know that demand is going to go down in the future, then you might not, you know, make that decision to turn on a plant that's less flexible. And this should look familiar as well. Um, you know, the general approach for doing this, for incorporating um, you know, future time periods is to look at some sort of discrete planning horizon, uh, and usually that's seven days or 168 hours, and to, uh, to run the program to find the optimal solution over the, seven, the first seven days. And the optimal solution here is, is, you know, we're minimizing cost, but what we're really looking for are the values of our decision variables, start on and all our x's. So we want to know what to do. Um, not just how much it's going to cost us. And so uh, the solution here is uh, basically a schedule for operating power plants over the first seven days. We only keep the first 24 hours. Um, and then we look at days two through eight, um, and then three through nine. And the advantage here is that if you are, um, you know, scheduling uh, electricity production in day three, um, in this first iteration, your information about, you know, what the world's going to look like in day three is less accurate than it would be if you wait two days and then make a decision about um, what you're going to do in, in day three. But you need to incorporate um, some forecast information so you don't make critical sort of uh, clumsy errors when, when turning plants on and off. So let's look through a specific example here. So we have a power system operator uh, who experiences uncertain net electricity demand. So net electricity demand would be, um, you know, demand that's uh, demand for electricity minus the availability of wind and solar, which we treat as demand reduction, and, and then even if if applicable, minus uh, the availability of nuclear power, which is typically not ramped up or down and, and is treated as demand reduction. So what we want to do is look seven days out into the future. Um, the operator has uh, sort of a, a quasi non-reversible decision to make. Um, in other words, uh, the decision it makes in the in the first 24 hours is going to impact its options in the, in the next several days. Um, and this particular decision is is whether or not to turn on a really big inflexible baseload coal plant. Uh, it costs thirty or three hundred thousand dollars to start. It has a minimum up and down time of two days. In other words, if we turn it on today, we have to leave it on for two days, even if electricity demand goes down in the future. And so our objective is still to minimize the cost of meeting electricity demand. And there are two different risks. The risks of turning the plant on uh, are the risk is that if, if demand ends up being lower than we anticipate, we won't be able to turn the plant off. Uh, and we'll be, we'll be stuck with maybe too much electricity, um, or we'll have to ramp the plant down uh, and produce electricity at a, at a lower efficiency, or we may have to sell electricity to a neighbor for less than it's worth, or we could lose money that way. Either Any number of those uh, scenarios would, <clears throat> would, would result in us losing money or, or at least doing something suboptimal. The other risk is that if you leave the plant offline and demand actually ends up being higher than expected, um, the plant might not have enough time to quick start lean, uh, to start quickly enough because this is a rather inflexible coal-fired power plant. Um, and if we don't do it in time, then we might have to use some sort of more expensive peaking power plant like a, a combustion gas turbine to meet electricity demand in the meantime while we're turning on this coal-fired power plant, and that could cost us a lot more money.
So we know how to set the, up the deterministic version of this problem. Um, you know, we've gone through what the objective function would be, we've gone through what the constraints would be, um, and what we want to really get into here is how the stochastic version would look. Um, and really it looks the same, at least numerically. Um, the only difference is, is what information we're going to consider about the days two through seven here. Imagine if we have a pretty good idea of um, you know, what the time varying parameters like electricity demand or wind and solar production are going to be for the first 24 hours in day one. Um, and we want to figure out uh, what actual information we're supposed to plug in for two through seven. Um, you know, we might have a, a, a forecast available for what, uh, you know, the weather's going to look like and maybe we can derive from that information what electricity demand could be, um, our best estimate of what electricity demand could be or solar or wind. Um, but do we really just want to use one estimate here? Uh, and that's sort of the question. And, and uh, as we move towards more stochastic optimization, um, I, we're going to move away from thinking that it's okay to just use one possible estimate of what those time varying parameters are going to be in days two through seven. Um, instead, what we really want to use is an ensemble of, of forecasts. So the idea of ensemble prediction is to start with what we know, or what we think we know, uh, like conditions, uh, current conditions or conditions in the recent past. And then given that starting point, we develop some sort of representative sample of potential pathways that the future can take using a numerical model. Uh, we could use a single model that's calibrated slightly differently for each pathway, or we could use the same model calibration for each one uh, and the paths could diverge just based on um, some sort of Monte Carlo sampling. Uh, there, there would be some s uncertain probabilistic element to the way that uh, the, each path evolves um, and uh, by randomly sampling through that trajectory we would end up with paths that become more divergent as time, as time goes on. So when you're doing ensemble forecasting, um, all of the predictions are, are at the same point initially, or very close together. And then as we get out further into the future, the, the predictions diverge. Um, and this, again, is a result of uncertainty um, or noise uh, in the model um, itself. So imagine if we um, came up and calibrated a... a um, uh, a, a wind power production model uh, for our system, um, and this is a time series model, uh, so it doesn't necessarily include any sort of um, you know numerical weather prediction or actual meteorological modeling. We're just saying that um, we fit this model for wind power production in current time period T um, to a really, really big data set of historical wind power production, right? And so what this is generally doing is, is saying, okay, we, we know that uh, wind is sort of random, but, you know, the wind in one time period is generally related to what the wind in the previous time period was, and that's related to the, what the wind was in the time period before that. And there's, so there's memory in the system here. And so we decided to use an autoregressive model with two lags, um, and so predicting what wind is going to be in any one time period involves knowing what wind was in the past only and then randomly sampling from some sort of distribution to introduce some sort of noise or, or random element into it. Um, and that's what this WT parameter is. And so the B parameters here are, are we're, we've already fitted these. These are coefficients um, that we find via linear regression by, by fitting them to historical data. Um, so we have this model, and given any sort of um, history of actual wind data, then all we have to do is apply this model to that wind data. And the only, um, the only difference between each of these individual paths would be the random sampling of the WT, right? So the, 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 the probability distribution that describes the noise in the system. Um, so that is what... Um, results in divergence among all these paths. So you can see the figure at the bottom. 
everything starts pretty similar and what, what we notice is that everything starts at a similar point and what we notice is that for the first you know 15 hours or so um, we see a lot of the same up and down movement right and that up and down movement um, is the the model behavior that's dictated by our B coefficients right so we're saying that you know um, there's sort of a sinusoidal pattern here at least there's there's autocorrelation and if wind spends several uh, you know wind power production spends several periods in a row declining then it's sort of likely to increase after that um, and so we see a lot of agreement within the you know first 10 or 15 hours and then beyond that point the cumulative effect of several different versions of this model not uh, with different parameters but with different sampling of WT values start to deviate right so you might get uh, one path that just by the luck of the draw gets really big WT values for the first 15 periods in a row another you know particular path might have all really small WT values 15 periods in a row and so as we um, look at you know a hundred maybe potentially different um, you know pathways for, for wind power production to take here uh, you can sort of get the sense for how these paths are sort of um, distributing themselves uh, almost in a normal way right they're dispersing around some sort of average wind signal right and so the average winds to the spread around that average wind signal gets wider and wider as you go out into the future and that's because the, you know, the cumulative effects of randomly sampling from this WT distribution over a long period of time uh, just results in a lot of uncertainty about what wind power production is going to be, um, you know, at hour 40 relative to what it's going to be at hour 5. And so it ends up looking a little bit like a random walk process. Remember, a random walk process is a special type of stochastic model um, where we're saying that the value of the process in the current time period is only a function of the value of the process in the previous time period plus or you know add the, the, the addition of some sort of white noise variable right so a random sample from a from a from a Gaussian or normal distribution um, and so everything if you start everything out at the same spot and all you're doing is saying you know, yt is equal yt minus 1 <clears throat> plus a random sample from a Gaussian distribution and you have a bunch of different possible pathways it could take, uh, then there's going to be some pathways that where it's it's happens to randomly sample um, negative values of wt every time or almost every time and there's going to be other ones that always sample a positive one and there's going to be some that um, sample positive for a while then go negative and, and vice versa and, that, and then this uh, as a result gives you all this this ensemble of different pathways that the process could take where um, where the the paths diverge basically as a product of time so if we develop similar projections for electricity demand uh, and and solar power production and wind power production um, then what we could conceivably do is solve the unit commitment problem over um, every uh, our entire ensemble of, of possible um, uh, possible future scenarios and that could be hundreds or thousands and the number of um, you know different uh, pathways that you're testing over may ultimately um, be constrained by the computational burden of that, right? So if it takes you, you know, 24 hours to run a thousand simulations, that's probably too much because you're trying to, um, you know, probably do this every 15 minutes to try to figure out, you know, a real power system operator would be doing this at least every 15 minutes in order to try to figure out what to do um, and, and to constantly incorporate new information into the decisions that they're making. Okay, so, um, you know, if we run, if we, if we end up running this unit commitment model over a high volume of, of simulations, right, over this entire, you know, 100 or 1,000 um, pathway ensemble, uh, 
of possible future scenarios, um, then what we're going to get are a thousand different answers, right? A thousand different answers about what the minimum cost uh, solution is and what the what specific values of our decision variables, at least in the 20, first, short, first 24 hours, um, are going to be. And so that might not be uh, easily interpretable uh, to the people that are actually making the decision about uh, what generation to, to use, what power plants to schedule. So ideally, we want one decision. And so we, we've talked about in the context of uh, decision analysis um, that a common criterion for making the decision um, is to find some policy that's feasible for all or almost all of the possible instances um, that maximizes or minimizes the expectation of some sort of function, right? And so in this case, we're trying to minimize the cost. Um, and so what, we're, what we really want to do is find this, the set of decisions that minimizes the expected cost um, of operating um, our system of power plants. So if we're specifically interested uh, in this decision about whether or not to turn on this big like coal-fired power plant or not, um, then one option for doing that is to look at the results of each model run, isolate the decisions made in the first 24 hours, and then analyze them to understand what percentage of the time the optimal first 24, the, the optimal least cost solution involves turning on the plant versus turning or leaving the plant off. In the first 24 hours, and in the case, and that you know, we could just look at a pie pie chart or, or whatever bar graph doesn't matter. Uh, in order to figure out, you know, assuming um, that our, each uh, each pathway in our ensemble is equally likely, um, then we would just go with the decision that um, uh, occurs most frequently. In this case, it would be leaving the power plant off. Um, in the first 24 hours. So the question then is, is it enough to just look at which decision is optimal in the largest number of model runs? Um, now let's take a slightly more nuanced approach. Um, we could run the following test. We could use the, we could look at the unit commitment model uh, and go ahead and turn the power plant on, right? We could just say as a default that the power plant's going to be on, and we could uh, perform a thousand stochastic model runs, each one using a member of this ensemble of possible future demand scenarios, uh, which again includes its net demand, so it would include the availability of variable renewable energy as well. Uh, and then we could also uh, test the unit commitment model with the power plant off. Again, uh, subjecting it to a thousand stochastic model runs, uh, each using the same, the exact same ensemble of, of possible future demand scenarios. So in this case, we would get distributions. Um, and since we were isolating two different decisions, what we're really looking at are the, decision, the, the distributions of, of cost um, associated with um, either leaving the plant on or leaving the plant off. And this is going to be a little similar to our discussion at the end of class last time about this risk versus reward trade-off. Um, so if you have two different um, you know, choices and the outcomes from those two different choices can be described uh, using a probability distribution, which is true in this case because we have a thousand different um, scenarios that we're testing for each of our decisions and um, presumably, I mean, let's assume that, they're, that those are Gaussian, dis Gaussian um, distributions. Um, they might have the exact same variance or different means. They might have the same mean but different variance or they might have different mean and, and different variances. Um, and so we've talked so far about ex the expected value being the decision criteria, but um, we, in some cases, it's not that easy to, to tell which is best because you can have slightly different means, um, 
but you could have different variances as well and you could run into a, a situation like in the bottom left where um, you have some greater possibility of very very low costs um, but higher on average costs which would be the black distribution and then you have um, lower on average costs but um, less of a possibility that you get into this region where you have very low costs um, so you, what you're doing is here is trading off some certainty about what the outcome is going to be for giving up some possibility that you minimize your cost to an even greater extent. Um, and this tends to be sort of a judgment call. Um, you have to balance um, the ex you know what you're seeking in terms of the expected value with what you're seeking in terms of the uncertainty around that expected value. So the point here is that we don't have to just rely on the expected value as the single decision criteria. We might have multiple objectives um, in scheduling power plants. Uh, that could be the highest or lowest expected mean. In this case, it would be the lowest. We want to minimize the cost. We might want to simultaneously minimize variance. Um, if we were worried about, ma if we wanted to maximize something like maximize profits, we could go with a solution that has the highest minimum profits um, or if we're trying to minimize costs we could have the lowest maximum so that would be sort of like eliminating certain uh, decisions that have any possibility of going you know beyond uh, you know beyond a certain cost threshold but in a lot of cases these objectives may conflict right um, the decision with the highest mean might not have the lowest variance, right? There could be trade-offs involved, and we need to find a way to evaluate uh, decisions and navigate some of these trade-offs between multiple, sometimes competing objectives. So, a, a really common one, uh, e you know, even if we if we're just talking about cost. I think there's there's multiple competing objectives, right? You can think about the minimum, the, the expected value, but also the uncertainty around that expected value as sometimes competing, right? Maybe not always, but sometimes they might be. Um, but there are other objectives that um, uh, power system operators are obligated to consider. Uh, in, in particular, reliability. Cost and reliability are the two big ones. So let's pretend... <coughs> Our results show that the lowest cost result, uh, both in terms of its expected value and let's say it also minimizes the variance, uh, is to leave the coal plant off. Right. So we're we're satisfied that in terms of economics, that's the best decision. But let's say that when we do this, we increase the likelihood that over the next seven days we will experience a power shortage or a loss of load, so an inability to meet electricity demand. Um, and that would be a very serious concern. Remember, this is a constraint on our system, on the solution of the objective function. But just because it's a constraint on the solution of the objective function, uh, it doesn't mean that there's no possibility uh, that we would experience a power shortage. If we're deciding a priori to turn the plan off, then we are exposing ourselves to uh, a range of possible future circumstances, one of which, or many of which, uh, might result in a power shortage because failures happen, right? We have to expect that a failure could happen. Um, and let's say that if we leave the coal plant off, the likelihood that something, something happens that makes it uh, impossible for us to meet electricity demand, uh, that likelihood increases. So ultimately, this poses a trade-off, right? We're talking about the cost of operations on one hand and the loss of load probability. Remember, the loss of load probability is a measure of how likely it is that you're not going to be able to meet electricity demand. And typically, um, you know, loss of load probability needs to be very, very close to zero uh, for utilities to make decisions not only on, on an operational basis, but also in terms of system planning and what capacity needs to be built into power systems. Um, and so we have this, uh, we could say that each, each yellow dot here uh, 
um, is one potential solution, right? One potential solution, um, uh, and not just in case of in the in the case of turning a coal plant, you know, on or off, but this would be incorporate a lot of other decisions as well, right? So we have a lot of decision variables about what plants we're going to use when, and Collectively, all of those give us a big range of possible outcomes that we can describe in terms of two objectives here, not just um, the objective of, of our unit commitment of, you know, problem, which is to minimize the cost of operations, but also we're now considering um, the outcomes of our decisions in terms of the loss of load probability. Uh, and what we see here um, is that you know, there's sort of there's sort of a trade-off where you're you know, you're increasing the cost of operations, um, uh, sort of as a function of decreasing your loss of load probability, and, uh, and what that means is the the more costly the decision you make, um, the the more reliable your system is. So that's a, a common trade-off, and not just the electric power sector, but a lot of other uh, industries where there's this trade-off between. Uh, risk and reward and cost and reliability uh, and in this case what we're going to form what we want to form is some sort of non-dominated frontier right uh, because every point along this red line um, we can't say is worse than any other point right in terms of uh, the trade-off between the cost cost of operations and, and loss of load probability for example Let's say we have this non-dominated frontier that's this red line, and <clears throat> that red line means that there's a point along, there's, a, there's a, a particular set of decisions we can make along this entire red line that results in some combination of cost and, and loss of load probability that we see here. So for example, if we were looking at this point right in the middle, we know for a fact that we've already identified decisions that we can make that result in both a lower uh, loss of load probability and a, a lower cost of operations, right? So the ideal point is at the, the vertex of this, you know, 2D coordinate system. So we want to get down here or close to here as close as possible. And if we know that there's this frontier of decisions that we can make, um, represented by this red line, all, all the decisions, all the possible decisions that result in these outcomes are dominated, when that means that they're inferior, right? We can identify any, any decision along this red line as being an improvement uh, in either the loss of load probability, the cost of operation, So we have this solution space, right, which is this big series of decisions that we could possibly make, and we can organize them in terms of our two objectives, the cost of operations and the loss of load probability. We've identified, it, identified a non-dominated frontier, which is a collection of decisions that, um, we, we, that um, are, not bet, are, not, are identified not to be worse than any other decision. They all were, their experience is a trade-off, right? We, it's up to us how we balance cost of operations and loss of load probability. There's no right or wrong answer there, necessarily. Um, but we, we know that every solution along this red line is possible, uh, and it's better than every solution um, uh, that's, that's shown by a yellow dot. Now, it's also possible that the solution space can then be separated into re regions uh, driven by one decision or the other. For example, we could say that the blue outcomes could be mostly represented by us turning the plant on, right? Which would be a higher cost of operations and lower uh, loss of load probability. Um, the red plants, the, the, the red region or the pink region, uh, could be associated with the decision to leave the plant off, right? Um, or the coal plant off, right? Uh, so generally a higher loss of load probability but lower cost and then a purple could purple the region could be sort of a mixture of both and so we can sort of organize our decision space uh, or solution space in terms of our decisions and, and how they vary in terms of cost of operations.
and the, the loss of load probability. Now, uh, as I mentioned, most utilities have security you know, constraints on coming up with decisions that um, meet some sort of threshold for system reliability, and in particular loss of load probability. So we could add a condition here, a uh, constraint to not the, the unit commitment problem, but, but our stochastic optimization process, um, and say that, okay, we're, we're not going to accept any possible solution that results in a loss of load probability higher than a certain threshold. And so if we are risk averse enough that um, we're, we're not going to accept any solution that goes beyond this dotted uh, risk threshold, then that, that significantly constrains the possible solutions that we can, uh, decisions that we can pursue. And in this case, um, it doesn't give us the least cost solution, um, but it does give us uh, a number of choices that we can make um, that do uh, satisfy our risk, risk threshold. So after all of this analysis, which is just <clears throat> trying to get it, what we're going to do in the first 24 hours, we then execute a decision. Now the next day, the process starts over. Uh, if the conditions are much different than we expected, then we might have to make a recourse or corrective decision. In other words, when we get to day two, um, if we made a decision in day one that was you know, more or less based on this expectation that demand was going to be high or low, and the world looks a lot different uh, in day two, or uh, our information about days later in the week and days six and seven is much different now because of uh, improved information, then we might have to make some sort of corrective decision. Um, for example, if we left the plant offline and then not much wind is available in day two, we might have to turn the plant on in day two, or if that's not, not possible, we'd have to rely on a, a fast, a faster responding peaking unit, right? Or even though that's, that would be more expensive. Um, and so the need for any recourse decision is then, is included into the, the, the problem, um, that addresses the actions taken in day two, uh, along with, uh, now a new ensemble forecast of what's going to happen in days three through eight. And when we make a decision again, we evaluate it in terms of potentially multiple objectives. Uh, and we try to find, you know, we, if, if those objectives are bounded by, you know, risk thresholds about, you know, loss of load probability, then that, you know, constrains our solution space. And then we make a decision um, based on sometimes, you know, heuristic decision, you know, criteria. Um, uh, and we make a decision about the, the next seven days. We keep the, the first 24 hours, which would be for day two, and then the whole process moves into the future. So this is uh, this class of problems in stochastic optimization is called multi-stage recourse problems. Uh, and so the basic idea here is that at any point in time, the op optimal decision should be based on the data available at the time the decisions are made and should not depend on, um, on future observations, right? So we, we, that doesn't mean we don't have predictions about what the future is going to be. Um, but we're understanding that the, the decisions we're making now um, are not necessarily going to be based on what is actually true in the future. Um, and so um, we're, we're, what we're basically trying to do is, is minimize um, the, you know, the arguments in the first part of the problem, which is, you know, what we are, um, what we're trying to do for the first 24 hours. And then we want to minimize along with that um, the ex, you know sort of the expected value of the second stage problem, which would be like days two through seven, right? So this is just a formal way of saying that we are we have sort of two different things we're trying to do. We're trying to minimize the cost of, of the actions that we take in the next twenty four hours um, alongside sort of. The, the, we want to minimize the expected value of, of, of minimizing, I mean, of 
meeting electricity demand over days two through seven. And so if we know, and this is just taking a closer look <clears throat> at the expected value of the second stage problem, um, you know, what we talked about in class to, or in this lecture today is using ensemble forecasts, right? Um, the, the alternative is to, if you already know what the, the, the probability of these sort of different states of the world could be in the future, um, then you can sort of do that by hand. Um, I think it's pretty rare that we, that we have that ability, and I think, especially for power system modeling, uh, incorporating the more dynamic aspect of how things can change day to day is, is an important, uh, you know, consideration when scheduling power plants. And so my experience is that people use ensemble predictions more than they do try to come up with discrete probabilities for, you know, for certain levels of electricity demand that you could use to, to you know, minimize the, the second stage problem here. So, um, I think, you know, one takeaway message here uh, is, is, is to try to understand why we can't just use the average, right? If we're talking about an ensemble forecast out into the future here, um, you know, for time periods that are close to where we are today, um, you know, the ensemble is pretty... Um, you know, compacted, right? It's, there's very little uncertainty around what the ex sort of expected value is. But as you get further and further out into the future, because of the random elements in whatever, you know, model we're using to make a, a forecast of what uh, this process is, in this case, it's, you know, it's wind power production or wind speed, um, then the process becomes much more certain, uncertain out into the future. And the question is, why can't we just draw a line right through the middle and say, all right, let's, let's assume it's, we're going to be in an average, you know, period. Um, I think there's some logic to that. You know, the thinking being, if you do, if you pursue the action that's designed around sort of an average scenario, um, you, you know, you won't experience big losses and you won't experience, um, big gains. Um, uh, and I, you know, I think that's sort of true. However, uh, when you do that, you, you're not allowing the objective function to experience the probability, even if it's a small one, of experiencing extreme outcomes, whether if that could mean wind is really, really high here or, or wind is really, really low here. And the reality is that the, the consequence of extreme outcomes may be much, much greater than the consequence of sort of an average outcome. Uh, and so, you know, even if it's an unlikely scenario, if the, if the cost associated with an unexpected decrease in a really, really substantial decrease or lack of availability of wind power production results in a blackout, right, then you would make a different decision here, right? So that has to be part of the distribution, right? That, you know, if this is, what you really want to do is look at a distribution. You don't want to just look at the expected value because if there are uh, values in that distribution that go beyond your tolerance to experience that level of risk, then you make a decision that eliminates the, you would have to make a decision that eliminates the possibility or minimizes the possibility of those outcomes occurring. All right, um, that's the end of this one. Uh, only one lecture left, uh, and it will be on capacity expansion.